Okay, this video is on probability, which is a field that was invented a few hundred years ago by a couple of mathematicians who were interested in determining the fairness of games. And in fact, it's still used today by casinos around the world to make sure that uh, their customers lose more money than they win. And the heart of probability is this idea of randomness. So these things like, for example, rolling a die or drawing a card from a deck of cards, spinning a game board spinner, these are all examples of what we call random events. And these are called random events because I don't know what any individual, I don't know the outcome of any individual event. For example, if I draw a card from a deck of cards, I can't say what that specific card is going to be. However, I can say how likely it is that I will draw a certain card. All right, so I don't know, for example, you know, the next card that I'll draw, but I can say how likely it is, for example, that I would draw an ace or how likely it is that I would draw a face card. That's probability. So there's two basic kinds of probability. Experimental probability means that probabilities are determined based on real world data. Or sometimes you say experimental data. And a couple of examples of experimental probability might be, for example, say the probability that a teen driver gets in a car crash. Uh, another example might be the probability that a person is, say, over six feet tall. So these are both examples of experimental probability because in order to determine, for example, the probability that a teen driver would get in a car crash, we would need a whole bunch of data about car crashes and how many of those were, for example, uh, involved a teen driver. That's experimental probability. The probability that a person is over six feet tall, we have a lot of data on different people's heights and we could say that you know, the probability that a person is over six feet tall, in order to determine that, we just need a bunch of data. And so that's what experimental probability is. Theoretical probability is different. Theoretical probabilities are determined without using real world data. Without using real world data. For example, the probability of drawing an ace from a deck of cards. I can calculate the probability of drawing an ace from a deck of cards because I know how many cards there are on a deck and I know how many of those cards are aces, so I can just determine that just based on the situation. I don't have to actually you know, draw a whole bunch of cards from a deck and record the number of cards. I can just calculate this value. Another example of theoretical probability might be, for example, the probability of rolling a five, rolling a five on a six-sided die. All right. Again, I don't need to do a whole lot of you know do a whole lot of you know throwing the die a whole bunch of times and seeing what numbers come up. I just know there's six sides on the die. One of the sides is a five, so I can calculate that probability without actually gathering a whole bunch of data. That's theoretical probability. All right, when we want to calculate probabilities, when we want to calculate the probability of something happening, the something is called an event. 
And the probability of whatever this event is, the probability of the event happening is written like this. Capital P, and then parentheses, and then whatever the event is. For example, 1A, the probability of rolling a 3 on a die would be written P rolling a 3 on a die. The probability of winning the lottery would be written P winning the lottery. And this is just kind of a shorthand notation that is often very handy for uh, writing down the probability that you're looking for so that you can calculate it. Probabilities are always expressed as a number between 0 and 1. Notice that a probability is not expressed as a percentage. You often hear the, the term, you know, what's the percent chance that something might happen. That's not technically speaking a probability because a probability is always a number that's between 0 and 1. It's not a percentage. The probability of an event that is certain to happen, we say that's a probability of 1. The probability of an, of an impossible event, we say that has a probability of zero. Now, when you go to actually calculate a probability, you see there in your notes, to calculate a probability, you count the number of ways an event can happen and divide this number by the total number of possible outcomes. And that essentially gives us a formula for calculating the probability of any event. And the formula is just written like this. Probability of an event equals the number of ways the event can happen, whatever event we're talking about, the number of ways the event can happen divided by the total number of possible outcomes. All right, so let's take a look at how we go about calculating some of these probabilities. All right, so example, uh, there's an example here in your notes about a bag that contains five blue marbles, six green marbles, and three yellow marbles, and we're going to draw a marble at random from the bag. And we want to know what is the probability of drawing a green marble, which I would write like this, probability drawing a green marble. Well. Since I know, according to my formula, all I need to do is figure out what's the total number of possible outcomes, that's the denominator, what's the number of ways this particular event can happen, that'll be my numerator, and I'll have my probability. So, let's do the denominator first. What's the total number of possible outcomes if I draw a marble from the bag? Well, since I have 11, 3, since I have 14 marbles in the bag, I've got 14 possible outcomes. Of those 14 outcomes, how many ways are there that this event can happen? How many ways are there that I could draw a green marble? Well, since I have six green marbles, there's six ways that I can draw a green marble. And if I punch that into my calculator, 6 divided by 14, 0.429. So 0.429 would be the probability of drawing a green marble from this bat. What's the probability of drawing a yellow marble? Again. I've got a total of 14 possible outcomes, since I have 14 marbles in my bag. How many of those 14 outcomes would give me this event? That is, how many ways are there that this event can happen? Well, since I've got three yellow marbles in my bag, there are three ways that I can draw a yellow marble. And 3 divided by 14 is 0.214. So this is the probability of drawing a yellow marble from this bag. What's the probability of drawing a green or a yellow marble? All right. Well, again, I have a total of 14 marbles in the bag. How many ways are there that this event can happen? How many ways could I draw a green or a yellow marble? Well, there's six green marbles and three yellow marbles. And six plus three is nine. So there's nine ways that this event can happen. So nine divided by 14. 
is 0.643. Now, you may notice that this probability here, the probability of this event, 0.643 is actually the sum of the probabilities of these two events. That is, if you add this probability and this probability, you get 0.643. And that's actually another way that you could calculate the probability of this event. And that's actually something that's called the addition rule. And we're going to talk about the addition rule in some more detail a little bit later. Okay, experimental probability. So in your notes there you have this table. It says, suppose a study of car accidents and drivers who use mobile phones produced the following data. All right, so this kind of table right here, this table is called a contingency table. It's also sometimes called a cross tab. And it's essentially, it's very much like a frequency table where you just count the number of ways something you know, can happen. This, however, is different from a frequency table because we're actually talking about two different things kind of at the same time. Was the driver using a phone or not using a phone? And did a driver have an accident or not have an accident? All right. So a contingency table, you typically have more than one, you have more than one variable in, listed in the table. Notice that in this chart right here, the total number of people in the study is 755. So that's all the people in this particular study that we are looking at. The row totals, here's my two rows right here. And notice that the total of what we call the row totals, the row totals are 325 and 430. That is the total of this row here, the drivers who had no accident and the drivers who had the drivers who had an accident and the drivers who did not have an accident in this row, that's 325. And the total of this row is 430. Column totals is similar. This column right here, the total in this column is 70. And the total in this column is 685. And notice when you add up, for example, the row totals, 325 and 430, you get 755. Notice when you add up the column totals, 70 plus 685, you also get 755. And that's just a particular feature of this type of table, which turns out to be very handy when we want to calculate probabilities. So let's take a look at how we go about calculating probabilities with this table. Okay, so it says Calculate the following probabilities using the table above. The probability that a driver is a mobile phone user. So one of the things that I'm going to do when I calculate probabilities here using a contingency table, very often if you, have, if you can phrase your probability in this way here using this probability notation, the probability that a driver is a mobile phone user, if you can identify the verb in this phrase, or in this case it's kind of a helping verb, then this kind of divides your probability statement into these two pieces. All right. So if I want to know what's the probability that a driver is a mobile phone user, I notice that the probability a driver, here I'm talking about out of all my drivers, how many are mobile phone users? Well, all my drivers, that's 755 because that's all my drivers. In other words, this piece of my probability statement gives me my denominator. That's the total number of possible outcomes, the total number of possible drivers. Of those 755 drivers, how many of them are mobile phone users? Well, let's see. 750 drivers, how many of my drivers use a mobile phone? That's this number right here. 325 of these 755 drivers use a mobile phone. So therefore, the probability that a driver is a mobile phone user is 325 divided by 755, which is 0.430. All right, let's try this one. What's the probability that a driver had no accident last year? Again, here is my 
verb, my helping verb, and it divides this probability statement into these two pieces. So again, the probability that a driver had no accident last year, so I'm talking about all of the drivers in the study, again, the probability that a driver in this study had no accident last year, so that's the total number of possible outcomes if I select a driver at random from this study. Of those 755 drivers, how many did not have an accident last year? In other words, how many ways are there that I could select a driver that had no accident? Well, if I've got a total of 755 drivers, how many of them did not have an accident? Well, let's see. Here's the numbers that tell me about having accident. 70 of them had an accident. 685 did not have an accident. So that's my numerator. And 685 divided by 755 is 0.907. Now, this last one, I'm going to get you started on this one, and then I'm going to have you finish it. The probability that a driver using a mobile phone had no accident last year. So here, again, is my verb. It divides my probability statement into two pieces. And now this one is slightly different from that one because now I'm not looking at all my drivers. I'm only looking at drivers that use a mobile phone. So I'm going to get you to try this one on your own, and we'll take a look at this answer in class.